Huh? Huh? Thank you so much. That's a nice way to celebrate a honeymoon, right? <laughs> you know, I've been called many things uh, throughout my life and everything, but a luminary. And now I've got an official stamp of approval as well. I really appreciate that. Getting an award is really depends on who gives it to you, uh, the context and who got it before and so on. You know, it's different if you get a review, a positive review of your book in Wall Street Journal or in The Onion or another satirical magazine. So getting this award is nice, but getting it from the Free Market Foundation is even better. I know what you've done. I've followed you closely around the world, what you've done for freedom in South Africa, both struggling against apartheid and fighting for human uh, freedom and reform nowadays. I am very impressed by that. So getting this award from you and taking into consideration who got it before me, I'm deeply honored uh, and, and moved to get that. Thank you so much. But also I can't rid myself from the suspicion, the mild suspicion that I got this partly because I'm Swedish. Because, you know, we've got this reputation for one reason or another around the world, a pretty decent reputation. I'm used to people thinking that Sweden is the best thing since motherhood and apple pie. And that's only partly deserved. There are other aspects of this as well. And that's why I wanted to talk about Sweden as well here. Uh, Sweden is the most successful society the world has ever known, according to The Guardian, the left-wing newspaper. Because Sweden is seen as the proverbial third way, a successful, peaceful, calm, decent, and also equal and egalitarian society, combining the openness and wealth creation of capitalism with the redistribution and safety nets of socialism. The Swedish society is, in a way, then the best of both worlds. And, and a lot of people think that you should emulate this all around the world. Uh, Bernie Sanders in the U.S. presidential uh, campaign talks about Sweden constantly and how the United States should emulate it. Uh, I hear voices within the ANC and others here in South Africa saying the same thing here, that we all want to be like the Swedish model. And I think that's about as helpful as telling an average-looking person to look like a Swedish supermodel. <laughs> because, because the problem is that there are certain preconditions that you need beforehand to make sure that you uh, that limit the ability to imitate. In the case of the supermodel, it's partly about genetics, it's about average height, it's about the looks, it's about the skin. Face it, the world isn't fair. We can't all look like my beautiful wife. That's, it's just impossible. You need, you need a certain context. And I think it's the same thing with the Swedish political and social model. There are various preconditions. It's about the historical background, the historical and cultural background that makes it difficult when it comes to economic and social models. And here's an interesting data point. When you think about Scandinavia or Sweden as the most successful societies ever, what, what is it with those policies that made this happen? Well, look at other Scandinavians who aren't in that model but try to struggle and create a decent life somewhere else. For example, the 11 million Americans who have a Scandinavian ancestors, they, are not, they haven't just created the same kind of wealth and actually equality as we've done in the Scandinavian countries. They've done it more. They're even richer than the Swedes and Danes who stayed in Sweden and Denmark. And their income is also 20% higher than the average Americans. And their poverty rate is about half the poverty rate of average Americans. You know this story when Milton Friedman, the economist, was asked by a an, an Swedish leftist to say, you know, in Sweden we don't have poverty. And he said, oh, that's interesting because, you know, among Swedes in the United States, I've never seen poverty either. So apparently you can take Scandinavians out of Scandinavia, but not the Scandinavia out of Scandinavians. <laughs> so this makes me want to talk a bit about those preconditions, about that cultural and social background that made successful societies possible and successful behavior possible wherever Scandinavians go, on average, on average. Gunnar and Alva Myrdal uh, were the intellectual parents of the Swedish welfare state, two leading intellectual social democrats and politicians who talked about in the 1930s how Sweden was uniquely well adapted to having a welfare state. They wanted to build it there for several reasons because of conditions that made it possible. 
The first one was a small and homogeneous population with high levels of trust for one another and for the government. Because Sweden never had a period of feudalism or uh, any recent history of invasions or anything like that. We were one homogeneous population and we weren't used to having masters and slaves uh, or peasants, but landowning farmers who owned themselves and also always had a political representation in, in um, Parliament, or at least, at least it goes hundreds of years back, which means that Swedes are used to seeing the authorities not just as some sort of invader, some sort of corrupt outsider who's there to take what you have got or make life miserable. They're used to seeing the bureaucrats, the politicians, as themselves, as their cousins or at least their second cousins, someone they can trust, someone who's not there to make a buck out of uh, from, from um, abusing uh, that power. And, and that sort of plays into the second precondition. A civil service that was efficient and free from corruption, partly because it was governed by ourselves, partly uh, because the affairs and documents of states were always public in Sweden, at least from the late 18th century, so they couldn't hide anywhere. And third, the third precondition is a traditional Lutheran work ethic. You are supposed to work. You want to work. And if you don't, your neighbors and your relatives will tell you that you have to work, whether it pays or not. Even if taxes rose and social assistance expanded, it was seen as a bad thing to rely on any kind of public assistance. You want to be self-reliant. Scandinavians have always frowned on those who take money that they're not entitled to. And when asked, under what circumstances is one justified in accepting government benefits to which one is not entitled? The Scandinavians lead the world, world in saying, never. And finally, that work would be very productive with Sweden's well-educated population and strong export sector. So Gunnar and Alva Midal said that if the welfare state can't be successful in Sweden, it will not be successful anywhere in the world. Keep that in mind, because that will be important when we reach the conclusion of this speech. If it couldn't work in Sweden, it couldn't work anywhere. So all those conditions, and this is important to remember, all those preconditions were there before Sweden was a welfare state, before the Social Democrats had power, which they got in Sweden only in 1932, after uh, the Midals were talking about this. Two Scandinavian economists recently documented that descendants of those who emigrated from Scandinavia 100 years before the welfare state are also more trusting in their fellow beings. They're also more well adapted and, and disposed to uh, engaging in cooperation, in trade, and, and everything else, no matter what kind of political system they ended up under. And their conclusion is that trust in others and social cohesion creates the welfare states, state rather than the other way around, since it's more tempting to give power to another, to a public official, if you do not think that he will abuse this power and take that money for himself. It's more tempting to give money to strangers if you believe that they are decent people who would never cheat the system. So those are the preconditions for the Scandinavian social and economic model. And in fact, it was not under social democ democracy that this came to fruition in Sweden. It happened before. In fact, the country built its wealth on a very open and deregulated economy with competitive multinational companies facing low taxes and free trade from the 1850s till the, about the 1950s. In the mid-19th century, Sweden experienced a classical liberal revolution when a group of liberal politicians opened up the Swedish economy for freedom, for business, for free trade, uh, freedom of religion, democratization, and uh, generally a very competitive atmosphere where uh, our companies, our businesses constantly faced competition from other places. And this was the era when Sweden began to be successful. As, as late as the 1860s, my ancestors in northern Sweden, they had to uh, mix um, a bark from the trees into uh, the bread to be able to survive because it was an era of, of hunger. But just years later, the Industrial Revolution got started in Sweden. And between 1860 and 1910, real wages for manufacturing workers, uh, blue-collar workers in Sweden, increased by about 25% per decade. And that was much more than happened later on. And this was during a period when the public sector in Sweden and the taxation, taxes in Sweden as a percentage of G GDP never surpassed 10%. 
of GDP. That was the start of the successful Swedish model. Between 1850 and 1950, Swedish income per capita increased eightfold as the population doubled. Infant mortality fell from 15 to 2 percent, and life expectancy increased by a whooping 28 years. And this was before the welfare state and, and the high taxes were even a glimpse in the, in the taxman's eye. So what happened later on? Well, the Social Democratic Party came to power in 1932 and has governed Sweden for uh, about 67 of the 84 years since then. So it's not difficult to see how they uh, have become associated with the Swedish model in every way. But they realized early on that a party of class struggle, of socialism, couldn't survive in Sweden with that kind of, um, of policies with those preconditions. Instead, they became a party of the middle class and for those who aspired to become part of the middle class. When they began to create social security system, it gave the most pension unemployment benefits, sick leave benefits and so on, to those with the highest wages. They tried to have a proportional system where the benefits were proportional to the amount paid in so that the middle classes would appreciate this system. It was not a policy of socializing businesses or creating government ownership of, of industry, of the economy. Rather, an attempt to socialize from the consumption side. The government would not take control of the means of production, but it would instead have an open business environment with big competitive multinational companies and then tax the results, the income of that growth. And in other words, a mar markets and competition for big business, a moderate welfare state for the people. And the trade unions, for their part, were always fairly positive uh, to the creative destruction of capitalism. They were always fairly positive to free trade in Sweden, a small uh, import and export dependent economy that constantly needed to specialize in what we did best, always and ever, which is interesting when we hear um, American politicians like Bernie Sanders uh, preaching protectionism and yet trying to be, wanting to be uh, like Scandinavia. He, which is often strange for leftist American politicians when they come to Sweden and hear what the social democrats, what the labor unions say in, in Sweden. When President Obama visited Sweden in 2012, the three main trade unions in Sweden, they sent him a letter and an invitation to meet and have a conversation about something that was very important for the trade unions in Sweden. And that was how do we promote more free trade in in the world, and especially between Europe and the United States, because they said that this is the one thing that can create, can create more jobs and better jobs in, in Sweden and in the United States. The chairman of the big social democratic trade union clarified that views on free trade must become more positive in the United States because they were afraid of the protectionist turn that Sweden took, that the United States took. So in other words, the social democrats in Sweden were always fairly pragmatic at least up until the decades that I will talk about now. As late as 1950, Sweden has had much lower taxes than other European countries and had lower taxes than the United States and more free trade. You know, President Eisenhower made Sweden famous in the 1950s when he said that Sweden, oh Sweden, yeah, it's the country of free love, high taxes and suicide. Yeah. Um, and actually he was wrong on the suicide um, part because it was just that Sweden was more secular than other places so we could talk more openly about suicide. It was not like, yeah, he just sort of happened to take his big rifle and go down into the basement and he tripped over it and shot him through his head. But actually it was registered as a suicide. So it seemed like Sweden had more suicide than others. And he was wrong about the taxes part. In 1950, Sweden's taxes as a percentage of GDP was 19. 19% in the United States, it was 24%. So he gave Sweden somewhat the wrong um, impression. I'm not even sure he was right on the free love account either, uh, actually, so, so it was wrong. But the Swedish third way is not just a myth. The semi-socialist welfare state was not really a myth. It did happen for a brief period of time. Sweden did experiment with this after 1970 between 1970 and the beginning, uh, early 1990s. The public sector almost doubled in Sweden as a percentage of GDP. Taxes were raised and the labor market was heavily regulated. 
But this was after Sweden was already one of the richest countries on the planet. In 1970, it was, according to the OECD data, the fourth richest country on the planet. Only then the Social Democrats got a sort of better self, um, self-esteem and thought that now we can do anything. We're the most successful society on the planet. Now we can even create a wel- this welfare state that we talked about. But, and this was the period when the Swedish model was made famous all over the world, and people looked to Sweden and saw a country that was both socialist and wealthy at the same time. It seemed like it was possible to become one of the richest countries on the planet and have a very generous welfare state with, high, uh, with a lot of public assistance everywhere. It was a miracle, a lot of people thought. But in fact, it was more like the old joke. How do you end up with a small fortune? Well, you start with a large fortune, and then you just make a few stupid mistakes. Uh, And that is what happened in Sweden at this time. Because this was also the time when the Swedish model began to run into problems, and Sweden started lagging behind. In 1970, Sweden was 25% richer than the OECD average of rich industrialized countries. 25% richer. 20 years later, of this semi-socialist welfare state. It wasn't socialist because they didn't nationalize businesses, but semi-socialist, I would say, from the consumption side. 20 years later, it was not 25% richer than the OECD average. The rest had almost caught up with Sweden. In 1970, Sweden had the fourth highest per capita income in the world. By 2000, Sweden had fallen to 14th. So this was the period when we began to lag behind. Those who think that Sweden became rich by being a welfare state, and that's how we should do it if we want to create a successful society, are probably the same people who would take a snapshot of Bill Gates today and say, look, apparently they can see that he's giving his money away, and he's one of the richest people on the planet. So if I want to be one of the richest person on the planet, I should start giving my money away to charity. Of course, it is the other way around. You have to make money before you can start handing them out. The policies that Sweden created during this time were unsustainable, as no other than the Swedish Social Democratic Finance Minister, Kjell Olof Felt, 1983 to 1990, later admitted. And he said that some of the policies were absurd. And he said, later on then, uh, that the tax system in Sweden was perverse. That's what he said later on. Because, but we could already see the beginning of the problems. The, um, Average growth rate in Sweden was halved to 2% in the 1970s and declined further in the 1980s. And that was before the huge crisis in the early 1990s, after a debt and inflation fueled boom. The currency had to be devalued five times to keep the industry competitive by a total of 45%. It was also a disaster for entrepreneurship. In 2000, when economists looked at the Swedish economy, they noticed that all the big businesses, all the multinational companies, all the businesses that we were dependent on for all the tax revenue, for all the jobs, they were created during Sweden's laissez-faire period. Only one of the 50 largest companies in Sweden had been created since 1970. And in fact, private enterprise had not created a single net job since 1950 in Sweden. That was the reality of this experiment, this 20-year experiment with uh, the semi-socialist welfare state in Sweden that got this worldwide renown and reputation, uh, but ended up in a failure so big that even the Social Democrats wanted to create new uh, reforms and starting to liberalize the economy. So was that the end of the story, this decline? Happily, no. There's, um, There's a comeback period as well. Today, Sweden is once again seen as a successful place and a successful economy. Sweden is the rock star of the recovery, wrote Financial Times in 2011, and leads uh, Europe in reform, because this was after a new reform period in Sweden after the uh, early 1990s crisis. With deregulation, reduced welfare benefits, a national school voucher system to give families the right to choose a school, partially privatized pensions, reducing taxes overall, and abolishing property taxes and inheritance taxes. Between 1975 and 2005, Sweden improved its score on the Economic Freedom of the World Index that I noticed a lot of copies of 
back uh, down here in the auditorium. Sweden improved its score by 2.3% on a 10-point scale. Might not sound that dramatic if you do not put it into context, but 2.3 points can be compared to Germany's 0 0.9 and to the United States 0 0.5, despite all Ronald Reagan's reforms. Sweden leads Europe in reform, as the Financial Times wrote. And this came with a result as well. Between 1975 and, two, and 1995, real wages in Sweden actually fell. Despite this being seen as the period when the labor movement really uh, got power in Sweden and implemented all its policies, real wages fell during those 20 years. But in the 20 years afterwards, when Sweden started liberalizing again, real wages increased on average by almost 70%. Percent, despite this being seen as the new neoliberal reforms in Sweden. There is still a legacy. Sweden is now very much a, an open economy, a liberalized economy. Product markets are open for competition and, um, and an openness. Uh, but the, and the public sector is now down to normal European levels. But it is still higher than in the United States, than in, the, in Britain, than in many parts of the world. The government provides the citizens with health care, child care, free colleges, and subsidized parental and medical leave. And taxes are almost uh, sort of 45% of GDP. How can we afford that despite, uh, how can we afford that and still be so economically successful? Well, one of the reasons is that we are more economically free in other areas. Having a more open economy, more competitive economy in other areas. If you look at the fr economic freedom of the world reports, you notice that Sweden is more economically free than the United States when it comes to the legal structure, when it comes to property rights, to sound money, to free trade, to business regulation, to credit market regulation, and so on. So that's one important part of the system. It's easier to make money in, in Sweden than in, in most other parts of the world, which makes it easier to also have more redistribution. And we also pay for the welfare state in a fairly brutal way, which um, socialists around the world must be familiar with. It's fairly brutal, but one that doesn't hurt production as much by squeezing the poor and the middle classes, because they are the ones who do not move when taxes are increased. The Social Democrats knew all along that they couldn't fund such a generous government by taking from the rich, by taking from businesses. Uh, there are too few, and the economy is also too dependent on them. So Sweden takes in a lot of revenue by a highly regressive value-added tax at a normal rate of 25%. Uh, the only tax where the poor pay exactly the same amount as the rich. That's how we, we can do that. It's brutal, and it's um, fairly punishing but it doesn't hurt production as much as putting all the taxes on businesses and individuals. In fact, when it comes to the corporate tax rate, it's down to 22%, which is, well, compare that to the United States, 35%. Uh, and there are also several privileges for the richest, uh, because Sweden, uh, the Social Democrats thought, if we have these high taxes, we must make exemptions for many of the biggest uh, businesses and um, for the richest. We have always had very generous tax deductions for capital costs and labor regulations were always tailored for the needs of the biggest companies. And to attract highly speciali uh, specialized experts from abroad, Sweden has a now a special expert tax, which is much lower than it is for uh, the middle classes and for the poor. And um, you know, Sweden has even implemented, under the Social Democrats, a special tax exemption for individuals and families who owned a large share of a listed company. Uh, yes, it is unfair, as the Social Democratic Finance Minister who introduced it said. It is unfair, but we have no other solution if we want high taxes. We have to give benefits to the richest in that case. <laughs> Otherwise, they will move abroad. So that's something to um, notice for those who think that Sweden is just about sort of taxing the rich and helping the poor. It's mostly a welfare state for the middle classes who get the proportional benefits, and it's paid for by the middle classes and by the poor themselves, via the VAT and by a, a lot of taxes. Some 85% of the benefits are really something that individuals pay for themselves straight up. 
And we can also afford it because of this traditional work ethic. People tend to work even when it doesn't pay that incredibly, uh, that, that much. We have these important preconditions that Gunnar and Alva Midal talked about. And we never take anything from the public coffers. At least we didn't used to. But culture isn't destiny. Uh, unfortunately for Swedes, we would love to rely on this, these old traditions. But if we do not have a, an institutional support, if the incentives begin to uh, change, sometimes that culture begins to change as well. What happens to those who are latecomers to Swedish society? The young, the next generation, the immigrants, people who have not been brought up under the same kind of cultural uh, working ethic, the same kind of attitude, the same kind of trust, but now face other incentives who are, in some instances, pro growth, pro-work, but not at all as much as it was before the 1950s in Sweden. Well, then those values and attitudes might begin to change. The proportion of Swedes who say that it is never acceptable to accept benefits to which one is not entitled to is still one of the highest in the world. But it has been reduced from 82% in the early 1980s to 55% today. Some erosion of these attitudes could be seen in the early 2000s when the number of people on sick leave exploded in Sweden. It was a very generous sick leave uh, system and uh, even though we were objectively healthier than almost any other population on the planet, we were suddenly sicker than any other population <laughs> on the planet, uh, suspiciously often during large sporting events. Um, during the Soccer World Cup in 2002, Swedish men's short-term sick absence increased by 41%. <laughs> and we didn't even make it past the eight finals. So imagine what would have happened if we made it to the finals in, in that era. So you can see that those preconditions that Midals talked about that made it so easy to build a welfare state, to have a generous welfare state in Sweden, in some ways are beginning to be undermined. And um, you can also see this, I think, partly in the employment gap between natives and foreign-born in Sweden. It is, Sweden is interesting because it's a society that expresses less racist and discriminatory attitudes than almost any other uh, part of the world. And yet the employment gap between natives and foreign-born in Sweden is twice the European Union average. So the regulations on the labor market the, um, the problem of getting a job if you're less productive, uh, because the trade unions still control the, the labor market to a large extent, um, and the ease with which you can get public assistance, distorts incentives and makes it more difficult to get a job, easier uh, to get public assistance. It was easier to have a one-size-fits-all model when Swedes were all alike, from the same background, with the same faith and attitude and a similar education. Now we're not. We're becoming less homogenous, and therefore we also need a more flexible model. We are becoming more like the rest of the world, always was. And in that case, we can't afford, we cannot have the kind of welfare state that we experimented with in the 1970s and the 1980s. And that, to sum up, I think is the lesson to the rest of the world that wants to emulate Sweden in so many ways. Even in a Swedish restaurant with the right ingredients, customers complain now ever more often. An increasing number of people are not even welcome into the restaurant. And this should make us worry when people in other countries attempt to prepare the same meal, but without having any of those ingredients. Remember Gundar and Alva Midal's warning. If the welfare state couldn't work in Sweden in this very socialized uh, way from the consumption side, well, then they concluded it couldn't work anywhere. Then the rest of the world should be worried. If countries have a tradition of a non-corrupt corrupt bureaucracy and civil service with an impressive work ethic and social trust, a larger government is more sustainable a bit longer. If not, it will result in more abuse of power and more waste. If you want to be Bill Gates, you can't start by giving away all your money. You have to start by writing software. You have to write by, start by starting a business and trying to be competitive. Only then you can reach that position. And if you want to be Sweden, you do not start with high taxes. You start by creating an open economy with hospitable conditions for individual achievement and entrepreneurship. That is the only way you can become a Swedish model. 
Thank you very much. Your uh, Honours uh, agreed to take questions and comments, uh, so if there are any, I'm going to stay seated and you can uh, select the, uh, from the audience. Any <coughs> questions to Your Honours? Can I ask about the voucher system? Do yes. all <coughs> families get it and the vouchers pay for everyone's education or do some schools get run by the state? directly rather than the use by pupils of vouchers? Yeah. The voucher system introduced in the early 1990s in Sweden, I think it's 1994 it was introduced, is a national school voucher system. So every uh, pupil gets a voucher. And this voucher is the sort of the average amount of what it costs of going uh, to a school. Um, on, on average, at least, there are some exceptions. And they can then use this to go to any school a private school, a um, public school, a lot of, uh, most schools are government sort of, it's the local government uh, that, that owns and runs the school. But you can use it to go to a, um, to any, a school that's owned in any kind of way, even in a, pro, a for-profit uh, school uh, or a religious school or something like that. But it has to adhere to specific requirements on what the pupils are supposed to know and learn and so on. And in the system, the way it works right now, it's uh, not possible to top it up somehow. You can't use the voucher and then pay extra for an extra superior education in a particular school. So there are some schools that are uh, entirely private and they do not accept vouchers. Instead, they only use those fees. But apart from that, then it's used everywhere in, in every school, uh, place to, to pick the kind of school that you would want to go in. Other questions? Yes? Um, I don't know enough about how the government is elected and so on in Sweden, but um, you're saying that the poor are paying a lot. Are they they're getting enough benefits that it's worth it to them? They don't want change, uh, like here, perhaps, or in the US, where the original founding fathers had a very homogenous society, and things might have been different if it stayed like that, but now the, the growing populace changes the government. So, so yeah. why is the government stable and supportive in Sweden? Yeah. Which I think it's pretty critical to being able to change yeah. policy or keep policy where the way it should be. Yeah. Uh, if we take it for granted that it is stable, uh, <laughs> we, we'll see about that. I would say historically it's because the um, labor movement, the Social Democrats and the trade unions, had such a... Um, they really subscribed to all, all the labor class votes. So, and they were... A, it's a very broad party. They used to have some 45% of the votes. So large parts of the middle classes and, uh, and the whole workers' uh, movement. Um, and this meant that they were also fairly loyal to the system and to the Social Democrats and what they uh, did. And remember also that Sweden had this incredibly rapid transition from very poor farmers in rural areas, and suddenly we were all sort of civil servants in, in uh, or at least white-collar workers in urban areas. So um, a lot of people saw that even though taxes went up, they could see that they got a lot. Uh, the real wages increased rapidly, and they could also see that uh, even though they had high taxes, they got a lot of um, extra support and a lot of things like child care and uh, hospital care and things like that paid for by the government. So I would say that traditionally, uh, the poor in Sweden have been very loyal to the welfare uh, system. Partly also because of this tradition of the homogenous uh, society. It was actually a lot of the those who made those decisions, a lot of the politicians came from that background and had that always had that support. But I think that this is beginning to change now that the society is becoming less homogenous, partly because the distance between the voters and the, the politicians is seem like it's growing in many aspects, also because those who get public assistance is not as homogenous as they used to be. And that is a result of, uh, well, lots of various things, globalization, the fact that we have different educations uh, now, uh, schoolings. We watch different uh, television programs, read different newspapers and so on, but also because of immigration. Uh, because suddenly it seemed like a lot of people um, are now sort of low income or reliant on welfare, but they're not part of the traditional working class. They're not part of the trade unions 
or anything like that. So we're beginning to see a tension between a lot of um, blue collar, to the extent that we still sort of have blue collar workers in that uh, way, but low income groups who begin to be hostile. They're very positive to the welfare state, but hostile to the immigrants who now come and want the same kind of public assistance. So there is this tension, and we've seen a, a growth of an, a, an anti-immigrant party, the Sweden Democrats, who are sort of pro-welfare state, pro-high taxes, but for the Swedes. And they're very hostile now that there are others who come and want the same uh, thing. And they have some 20% in the polls. And the Social Democrats, who used to have 45%, they are now down to 20 uh, 24% in the polls. So there is this tension, and where that will lead, we do not know so far. But the only thing we can say is that Sweden is becoming more like other places to that extent, and that includes a government that is less stable. It's in, right now, uh, the Social Democrats took power from the center-right last year. Uh, this, they, the center-right run ruled the country for eight years, now it's Social Democrats with a Green Party. But they, to combine, have not much more than 30% of the votes. So they're dependent on finding new strange coalitions in every single issue that they're, they're facing. Uh, so it's, it's a very unstable political situation right now, I would say. OK, let's see now. I think it's there, and then there, and there. So please. You mentioned the suicide rate. Sweden does have a reputation of high, higher suicide rate. I believe it should be above average, maybe not as bad as Eisenhower says. I also believe it's got to do with something of uh, the amount of sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, maybe you can demystify that. <laughs> um, I think we're fairly normal. I mean, it's not excessive compared to other places. I think it's this the fact that we had better statistics on it created that impression. But yes, it's a bit higher than, I would say, on average. Uh, and to your hypothesis on the sunlight in, in Sweden, uh, we could say that one of the few countries who beats us big time is our neighbor, Finland. Um, and Estonia is pretty high there as well. So perhaps there's something about... Uh, being a very sort of um, a low population country with a lot of distance to everybody else, and it's dark. <laughs> it's it's traditionally. I mean, if you look at the Ingmar Bergman films, that's uh, that's the <laughs> Swedish. It begs the question that you economically so successful, and you also when you write about happiness, so it's yeah. economic. Uh, yeah. You know, success and happiness. Yeah. Interestingly, Sweden, if you look at the, it's difficult to measure happiness and well-being uh, unless you scan the brain. Then you can see that it's the, in the left prefrontal cortex. You can see it lightening up when you're really happy. But, uh, but apart from that, and we can't do that with whole populations, we can ask people, how happy are you with your life on, on the whole, on a 1 to 10 scale? And uh, in those, uh, in statistics like that, Sweden and Scandinavian countries are happy. Uh, happier than, than many other parts uh, of the world and happier than the rest of Europe. There are so many errors uh, that could be there somewhere. It's often said that the French, they're miserable, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but, it's, <laughs> but it's said that they say that, oh, yes, I am miserable, because that's a cultural attitude. That's something you say, because it makes you seem like you're a bit more interesting than, sort of, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Whereas in other places, saying that you're happy is means you're successful. Uh, some say about Scandinavians, the fact that we say that we're so happy, it's actually a way of saying, leave me alone. Because <laughs> saying that, uh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm very sad, it begs other questions. So why? Can I help you? Whereas we're sort of, no, sort of, leave me alone. I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm fine. Um, but there are also other indicators when it comes to how happy you think others are, your neighbors, um, health indicators, and so on, are fairly good in Sweden, which is strange because we also tend to commit suicide unless all those who are miserable commit suicide and only the happy ones are left. But that would be a, that would be a strange uh, conclusion. I, I, would, I would think, and some researchers say, that uh, it means that average happiness is not that correlated to suicide. Suicide is something else uh, and it has more to do with other things, including your support system, 
when it comes to family, when it comes to friends, and, and so on. And you could say that Swedes are, are fairly happy on average, but we also tend to be a little bit more sort of keep a distance to even our families and uh, perhaps because of long cultural uh, um, uh, traditions, perhaps because it's of, of the darkness, I don't know. Which might mean that when we're, when we're really miserable, we tend to do crazier things than others would do in, in other places. And we might feel that we're not as responsible to others for what we do uh, if, we, if we do that. So that's just some of the, um, if I'm speculating on this, um, this correlation. Um, we could say, though, again, suicide has been, uh, been reduced in Sweden and many other, um, many other places since, uh, since the 1990s. Um, could be because the economy has ticked up again and people get jobs and so on. Could also be sort of we've got better medication nowadays. So it's, there are many factors. That's the only conclusion I've got. Um, on, on average, on happiness. This is my last thing, then we'll move on. Um, we can see a very strong correlation between being happy and living in a stable, rich, democratic, and fairly market-oriented society. Um, you can be a Swede or a Dane, you can be a Swiss, or you can live in Iceland or something like that. Those countries tend to be the, uh, the happiest, uh, which is, leads to all sort of uh, speculation. There was a question there, I think. There, sorry, yeah. yes. Uh, my question did relate to happiness. What yep. sparked your interest in trying to measure it? I th that's a very good question. Uh, one of the reasons was that I've dealt so much with economics constantly and, and uh, economic history and uh, what makes a society, a country successful. Um, but then at some point you have to start wondering, is that it? Is that the only thing we want, more money? Uh, or are there other preconditions uh, for a good life? Uh, is there any way of directly measuring how happy we are with life, the kind of life satisfaction that we've got? And of course, for personal uh, reasons, I, you have to start thinking about those things at some point. It's what's, what's the meaning of, of life in, in uh, some way? And how does it relate to uh, another favorite topic of mine, freedom? Uh, and, and that's what we can see clearly in literature. Um, on an individual level, but also on a national level. If people feel that they have no choice, if they feel like uh, they are not responsible for anything, then it's very difficult to get this sensation of happiness, um, which is, it kind of sounds intuitive, but in other ways, it's also counterintuitive, because a lot of people think that happiness is sort of having everything taken care of for yourself, um, having sort of someone solve your problems and leading a, an easy life. But that's not really how we want to live, is it? I mean, that's a nice vacation. That's a nice honeymoon. You want someone to take care of everything that's difficult and you're out there in the sun. But that's not how you want to live your life in the long run. After a while, you have to make your vacation more interesting or difficult. You pick up a book or you have to meet other people or you have to go out on, a, on an adventure somewhere. And that's, I think, tells us something important about human life as well. We need to do difficult things. Uh, we need challenges in our lives that we feel that we chose, we are responsible for it, and then hopefully succeed. Uh, that gives us the kind of self-esteem, that, that, uh, that feeling that you've accomplished something that's important. There is one great episode of the old sort of 60s, I think, show, The Twilight Zone, with all those strange, bizarre stories about the world. Um, that really got me interested in, in the happiness as well. Because this is a story of a bank robber, and forgive me if I'm sort of venturing out in a strange direction here, uh, but it's a bank robber, he's shot during one of his heists, and he, he ends up in the afterlife. And, and it's, he's su surprised because he ended up in the nice place. So, so he's welcome and sort of, whoa, oh, welcome here, and uh, you'll get uh, uh, what you need. It's good life, good food, good even wine, and um, he gets this uh, f friendly uh, people and individuals, and he leads a good life, even a very good life. He gets to gamble in the casino and, and do all of these things, and everything he wants, he gets. Um, he always wins in the casino. Uh, he, he wins the best women in this afterlife as well. And after a while, he's sort of bored with it, because what's the point? I win every time, so why should I gamble? I, I get everything I want. Why should I do?
do anything. So he goes back to this angel that helped him out and said, uh, who welcomed him, him in the first place, and tells him, look, this is the wrong place for me. You, you're wrong about me. I'm not a good guy. I, I was a bank robber. I, I should have gone to the other place. I want to go there. And then the angel turns to him, and in a kind of ruthless and uh, but yet eloquent way, points out, what makes you think that that is the other place? This is hell. <laughs> always, always getting what you want without ever working for it, without ever choosing, without ever feeling responsible for the result. That could be the most miserable uh, result in a way. And that's a somewhat counterintuitive solution, but makes perfect sense if you look at people who are the happiest when you look at the labor market. It's entrepreneurs, people who work constantly and they're, they have debts and it's awful and they have to deal with lots of difficult employees and uh, lots of difficult customers and it's difficult to get the funds, lots of competitors, it's awful and they love it <laughs> because they, they constantly have this responsibility to do something and then that gives you this boost to, to actually well-being, happiness and life satisfaction. Over there. Getting back to our discussion of the education and, and, and the uh, doctor, so what you, what, one of the problems, potential problems, is that once it's a case of whoever pays for the price of calls the tune. So, to what extent does the government intervene in the actual uh, education uh, curriculum yeah. because they are paying? They're saying you must do this or the other. Yeah. Is, have you noticed that? Or is that, is that what's happening there? We have noticed that, and that is a big problem. Um, and that was something that uh, people warned about in the beginning when this system was implemented, that there's always this risk that the government will try to interfere in all ways. And, uh, and that has also happened. And not just when it comes to sort of subjects and uh, the time spent uh, dealing with different ways, but also to the extent that they intervene with how um, different classes are organized, what the teacher does with his or her time and, and things like that. And that is beginning to uh, be a, a, a worrying sign, I think, in Swedish schools. Uh, partly because we need experiments. We need different solutions to find the next better uh, approaches to education. But also because it's not as interesting to become a teacher if you can't do it in the kind of way that you think is most suitable to your class, to your subjects, and so on. So there is this tension now between teachers and uh, and uh, the government in many ways, uh, because you need that movement. And coming back to the question of life satisfaction and and the freedom to to do things in in your own way, um, a lot of them have to do it in sort of uh, uh, in a partly hidden hidden way. If they want to sort of really uh, be um, Trying different, uh, uh, different new ways, new ways of, uh, of um, new approaches to to education. Uh, and I know know this fairly well because uh, my wife is a teacher and uh, she deals with those things uh, every day. Uh, the demands from someone, from public officials and politicians, who sits hours away and have no idea of the specific conditions in a specific school. Uh, and the teachers trying to do the best of this situation. That is, that is difficult, and that's something that we always have to keep in mind when we're discussing school reform. There's always this temptation from politicians when they want to improve schools to come up with a new solution. It could be a new system of ranking the, the pupils. It could be uh, the number of uh, uh, children per teacher or uh, how much time is spent on a specific um, uh, subject and so on. And that's always what we get with new governments, unfortunately. Rather than sort of being a little bit patient, looking at what works and what doesn't work, and then allowing more schools to imitate what works, they want those symbols. They want to be seen as strong politicians who have really accomplished something. So we have to struggle with that every day. So okay. there, should we take, oh, do we have time for two more questions two more? in a row? Okay. Because we had two more questions yeah. there, and then... Well, then I'll see one over there. What, okay. What is the crime rate? The crime rate, okay. I'll talk yeah. about that. We what, can... What, what sort of crimes are committed, and what's the protest movement that's been about, if any? 
protest movements. We don't have that word in Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I can take all questions in at the same time. Um, yes. I just want to know what, what are the uh, businesses that you know make Sweden's economy grow at the moment? I, you know, just to get a sense of where are they, which is coming from, yeah. and because you know that's one of the differences between different countries, like say ours. You know. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And is unemployment high there or not? Yeah. So, sorry, the last thing was unemployed. Unemployed. Is unemployment high? Is if it's high. high. Is it high? Is it high? Yeah, okay. Just Thank you. Think one more there and then maybe. Okay. Yes. Yep. Um, very good question. I'm so happy you're so interested in Sweden. Um, to take it all in, the, to start with, to start with horrible things, I will start with taxes and then move on to crime and then to businesses. I think that's a nice trajectory. Um, the, the tax rate uh, used to be incredibly high in Sweden. I mean, we were up there at uh, 85, 90 percent, and in the 19 early 1980s. We had a famous case of one, um, one of our most famous authors, Astrid Lindgren, who writes all these children's books about people long stocking and all, 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 the, all the, the others. She had to pay 102% tax on the margin uh, because she also paid her social um, contributions because she was um, self-employed. And she actually wrote a short story about this, about a witch and the tax authorities and how the tax authorities were worse than the witch. Um, so, and, and that's correct. The founder of IKEA, uh, the furniture, Swedish furniture shop, uh, moved away. The founders of Tetra Pak, they moved away uh, because they had to. Taxes were too high and the inheritance tax were so high that it would be impossible to keep a family business going after the generational shift. And all our great sports stars, the Bjorn Borgs and all the others, they all moved from Sweden in the 1970s and the 1980s. But then uh, they began to reduce taxes, partly because of this, because, partly because they realized that they were dependent on these individuals. So they had a, um, a tax reform that was meant to uh, make sure that most people paid 30% in income tax and a top, the top rate would be 50%. That was what the Social Democrats wanted. Now, that has crept up a bit since, because every government adds another percentage point or something like that. So the highest marginal tax rate now is about 56% in Sweden. Uh, but it's, it's, you would have to earn quite a lot to, uh, to make that. But, but it means that it has crept up and that we need a new tax reform in Sweden. But on the other hand, the Social Democrats have also, and the centre-right governments, have created a lot of exemptions um, to, um, to this tax system. They've abolished the inheritance tax, partly to make it easier for the next generation to do this. They've abolished the property tax. They've created these exemptions at the top, often in many cases for specific experts or specific owners and, and others. And, uh, at the same time, the centre-right government now, in the last eight years, they've also created uh, many um, s sort of uh, reducing tax rates from the bottom to reduce the marginal effect when you go from welfare into work, which has been important for employment uh, in, in Sweden. So I'll get back to employment as well. Um, the crime rate in Sweden, um, it's so difficult to compare this between different countries because we have various different traditions of what do you report as a crime and, and, uh, and what um, is not being reported and so on. Um, but I would say on the whole it's a fairly average as it, for a European country. Um, a little bit lower on the whole. It has been reduced as well in the last few years as it has in many other uh, places partly because we, as a country, we grow a little bit older and we don't want to be out and fight late at night to the extent that we wanted when we were uh, younger. Uh, which kinds of crimes? Well, it's a lot of uh, the things to do with uh, 
general fraud and uh, internet fraud were good. We have a high internet penetration rate in Sweden, and so a lot of internet fraud as well. Um, it is often said that Sweden has a high rape rate, uh, that Sweden or Malmö or something like that is the rape rate of, of uh, the world. Um, that's partly because uh, I think we um, have better reporting. Uh, those crimes are being taken more seriously in Sweden than in other places. Also because we've changed the definition of uh, rape, so that many cases of sexual abuse that would be termed sexual abuse in other countries are seen as rape in Sweden. And that's one of the reasons why we have had this long-term, uh, I don't know if you follow this, um, complicated story with the founder of v WikiLeaks, mm -hmm. who uh, was report who was um, charged, he wasn't charged, but he's been sort of investigated for rape in Sweden. Um, and he stayed at the Euro Ecuadorian embassy in London because he doesn't want to go to Sweden because sexual abuse is seen more sort of harsh in, harshly in Sweden than in other places. Protest movements, do we have those? Um, we, that happens, but not in the kind of violent way that we, uh, we see in many other uh, places. We're used to sort of calm protests and, and things like that in Sweden, at least compared to others. There are exceptions but they would be fairly mild com compared to other things. Even sort of our farmers, when their farm subsidies are being reduced, not even they are out f sort of fighting in the streets. So it's, um, uh, that does not happen quite a lot. So which businesses do we have? How much uh, unemployment? Well, traditionally, it used to be our, our natural resources. We had a lot of them, the iron ore, uh, the iron, the steel. Uh, the forests, uh, timber, paper, that used to be the backbone of industry, those traditions. Um, and those were the ones that were opened up and liberalized in the 1860s, 1870s, and helped us to get the revenue to start new, more entrepreneurial and knowledge-intense industries. What happened then was that in the 1890s and uh, early 90s, 20th century, we got what was called the genius industries. Lots of entrepreneurs who invented or at least borrowed new technology and innovations from other countries when it came to sort of telephones, when it comes to, came to cars, when it came to uh, all kinds of uh, industrial uh, mechanical processes, heavy equipment, heavy machinery, things like that. All those things that was the backbone of Swedish industry, well, still is, I would say, in, in the early 21st century. But now we can see them being rivaled with new service industries. Uh, and that could be everything from um, different companies that wants to um, um, find the right personnel for businesses or security services, uh, but also everything related to the internet and information technology. Uh, gaming is a huge industry. Uh, we used to be proud of our Volvos, but we, the Volvo cars, but we sold uh, Volvo to a Chinese uh, company at uh, a, lower, um, a lower cost than one of the new upstarts in gaming was sold to, uh, to a big gaming company recently. So we've seen that in um, sort of in the urban areas, knowledge intense uh, and information related industries tend to be something something that's big right now our problem though is that though they do not create the same kind of um, low the, the kind of jobs that you get if you have a low education less productivity and so on so we haven't really opened up those kind of services to the same extent and the labor unions in sweden try to uh, try to uh, avoid opening up those to a lower de facto minimum wage, which we would need in Sweden to get, especially all the immigrants that now come from, from Afghanistan, from the Middle East, from North Africa, and so on. If they enter a labor market where the de facto minimum wage is 80% of the average wage, it means that if they're less than 80% productive of the average, then they're priced out of the market and they become a permanent middle class instead. So that's my great worry of Sweden. I think we'll get the new great competitive businesses that function in a free trade oriented uh, economy. They will continue to spread the name of Sweden around the world. But our main problem right now is getting those jobs and services to people who have lower productivity, lower education right now. Otherwise, we'll have 
huge problems in the future. Thank you.